Hi there. I am once again back to vlogging. Uh, you'll all be aware that last week the remains of Richard III were positively identified using DNA evidence. The circumstantial case that had actually been built up beforehand was very strong anyway. The DNA, the DNA evidence literally was just icing on the cake. The body was found to have quite a few significant wounds on it. I'm now going to be doing a little bit of something that I really do enjoy doing. It's something that I almost live for. Experimental archaeology. On the grounds that I'm actually effectively a piece of experimental archaeology myself. I'm going to be looking specifically over the next couple of weeks at two of the wounds that were inflicted. They look as though they were actually possibly inflicted at the time of death. One, never go anywhere without a skull. Trust me, they're so useful. One of them runs from here, which is called the hyperglossal canal, and radiates for about an inch and a half outwards. It's a deep incised wound. And on the outside, just about here, it actually does have an incision. So we can show that a bladed instrument was used for that. Now initially I'm going to be looking at the circumstances in which that could have been inflicted. The second wound is a much larger shearing wound, which literally took off everything in this area. and left, Sorry, this area here. And left virtually nothing there. That could have been done with something along the lines of one of these, which is a crescent-headed axe. Very, very popular. Crescent-headed axes concentrate all of the force of any strike wherever they happen to hit, as opposed to a straight axe, which will very often act at a tangent to the actual uh, point at which you're moving it. <coughs> it looks as though the shearing effect is coming in from here, and then finally, literally, catches underneath here and the jugular and carotid canals. I believe these are the inferior jugular. This is possibly one that really, really did kill him. But then again, there's also the possibility it might have actually just been to finish him off. Initially, though, I'm looking at the possibility that Richard was actually mounted. How do you bring down a fully armoured mounted man with the wounds that you actually see him exhibiting at the uh, time? Uh, and this is an unarmoured and... I'd say almost ad hoc experiment we did this afternoon down at the stables with my horse and a friend of mine who was good enough to allow me to poke over the stick. So this is the very first thing that's actually going to be done. Over the next week I'll be producing a couple more to show how it relates to armour and how it would actually then relate to getting him off his horse. The good thing about this one, it means that he could actually be injured in full armour. So we're going for mounted first, dismounted second, Post-mortem third. Have fun. This quick experiment is to demonstrate a means by which the wound to the left occipital uh, area of Richard III's skull could have been inflicted if he was actually mounted at the time. Assuming Richard was fully armoured, this is an unarmoured test, we will do an armoured test later. Vulnerable points on his armour will be in the following areas. Under the armpits, the buttocks, which would be very likely to be covered by the candle, and underneath the brim of the helmet at the back, the area where he was in fact hit. On a battlefield, people don't want to wound. They want to remove the threat as soon as possible. Nobody was interested in capturing him. The whole point behind this battle was to uh, bring about a dynastic change in England. Nobody wanted to take him prisoner. This is a glaive, a very popular weapon from the late 14th century all the way through to the late 15th century. Effectively it's a sword on a stick. This is a reproduction for combat purposes. In reality it would be much sharper. The cutting edge itself is slightly curved, thus allowing elongation of the cutting edge in relation to the actual length of the weapon itself. A simple thrust straight to the back of the head would be called, would be in a slightly circular motion. I'm actually exaggerating that uh, slightly here. That's because to thrust, one actually wants to use the right quadricep, the left deltoid, the left trapezius, and the left latimus dorsi. Latissimus dorsi, sorry. It comes in straight underneath the skull itself. At this point, Richard's own body weight plus the weight of his helm would be working against him. 
they would try to hold him down into the saddle against the sharp edge being thrust into the base of his skull. This cutting edge then would leave the characteristic incised wound we see to the left side of the wound to the left parisian. This is one possibility. A second option is a pole arm such as this. This is a representation of an English bill again. It's kept blunt because we use these for combat purposes. These were probably one of the most common weapons on the battlefield at the time. Designed to aid critical distance by putting a large, heavy, sharp object on a long pole. It also facilitates the use of this weapon in formation, allowing two or three ranks to work in concert. <clears throat> They're also a pretty effective individual weapon, especially against armoured mounted men. As can be seen, my critical distance now exceeds the critical distance of my opponent. What could have happened again is, with this sharpened edge, a simple thrust, again using the spolder, underneath the brim of the helmet, straight in to the base of the skull. Again, with a sharp edge on the inside, because of the way in which the human body works, instead of a direct push, there will be a slight leftwards motion from a right-handed person, because they're requiring to use a thrust with their left wrong, right leg providing a lot of the motive force. This pushing up into there will effectively leave a very, very similar wound with an incision to the left and as this breaks into the skull area itself, a broken area around any kind of diamond shape or spine in this area. This weapon was developed with horsemen in mind. It was not designed to allow people to get away easily. You'll note also there's a back spike on here. <clears throat> that means that the weapon itself can be used as an axe in a long, smiting motion almost. A lot of kinetic energy going all the way through the radius of this arc, which would then possibly be used to defeat Richard's helm. Certainly, we know from fight manuals of the time, weapons like this were used in very, very long and powerful hits. That's a good boy, Bob. Good boy, Bobulus. Yes, I know.